Good evening, everyone, and welcome to number three in the Wheeler Centre's Africa Talk series. Um, thank you so much so far for the support for the series. It's been really, really fantastic seeing so many people coming and being interested in, um, you know, Africa Talks. Um, I'd like to begin by first acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet tonight, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. So tonight we will be looking or trying to discuss Australia's relationship with the African continent, what that looks like, what it should look like. And to help me discuss that, and hopefully a little bit more, um, is right next to me, Roger Phillips. And Roger Phillips is a vice president of the Australia Africa Chamber of Commerce. They've recently had a relaunch. They were previously known as the Australia Africa Business Council. Correct. Um, and it's an organisation that aims to assist and facilitate cross-cultural learning in the form of fair commerce and trade. And he's also the co-founder of two startup businesses based out of Lagos, Nigeria. Please make Roger feel very welcome. Thank you. And sitting next to Andrew, uh, sitting next to Roger is Andrew, Andrew Barnes, and he's the director of the Southern Africa and Indian Ocean section at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and he's also the ma he's also managing Australia's bilateral relationships with the countries of Southern Africa and the Indian Ocean, and Andrew's section has responsibility for the management of DFAT's program in Africa. Please make Andrew feel welcome. Okay, so we've got a bit of ground to cover, and I guess my first question is, because I hear this quite a, quite a lot, is that, you know, Africa's on the move, Africa's rising, <coughs> where are we? Is Africa really rising, and what does that look like at the moment? So you can take that up. Okay, Scintilla, a good question. Is Africa really rising? I, was, I spent just the last month, uh, I got back to Australia a week and a half ago, um, spent time in Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Ghana. South Africa as well. Uh, Africa, certainly uh, from Ethiopia's point of view, they have a, um, a, a disposition towards trade, openness. The Europeans fully realize this. Um, the Americans understand this, that Africa is opening. They've got a, 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 a growing uh, population. They, um, the majority of their uh, population is under 20 years of age. They are open to West, the West, they are understanding trade, and they are open to business. So Africa certainly is on the rise. Governments are a lot more stable and open to foreign investment and trade in a very serious way. So same with Ghana, same with South Africa, and certainly same with Nigeria. Um, at every meeting that I had, it came back to how can Australia invest in those four African countries with a view to setting up production. You have land being made available in Ethiopia, right next to the airport, at virtually next to nothing. So you have organizations like Samsung, um, Hyundai, um, LG, all moving in there with a view to, to, to really positioning their business, businesses for future growth. Andrew, is Africa on the rise? Uh, yes, certainly it is. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the statistics speak for themselves. Uh, there are, uh, I think, seven out of the ten fastest growing economies in the world at the moment are in Africa. Uh, Africa is positioned in, in many respects how Southeast Asia or, or uh, Asia was uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, both uh, in, its, in the, the population projections are for um, a, a huge increase in the population. I think it's by 2060, the population of Africa will have grown from 1.1 billion to, I think it's 2.6 billion. Uh, the mega cities of the world uh, in the coming decades will be in Africa. Kinshasa in uh, the DRC, the capital there, will, uh, have, will be the biggest French-speaking city in the world. It'll uh, surpass Paris. Uh, the African countries are certainly looking uh, to do all they can to grow their economies. Uh, the large population increases that are going to come are going to present huge challenges to uh, provide employment for the, uh, the youth. 
Mm -hmm. That's uh, half the population of uh, the, the projected 2.6 billion will be under 20 by 2060. So uh, if it doesn't grow, it's going to have troubles. Okay. So given that wonderful picture that you've painted for us about, you know, this, this content that's on the move, mm -hmm. the progress that's being made, where does Australia sit with that? You know, how are we engaging with the continent? Um, you know, I think Tim Costello made comments around when, you know, the aid budget was slashed to Africa about how he felt, you know, Australia had effectively abandoned Africa. Where do we sit with that? You know, how have we abandoned the African continent? Well, I guess there's no getting away from the fact that our bilateral aid program with Africa was, was cut in the last budget, uh, but that was a government decision in the context of the, uh, the government's overall priorities and, uh, and uh, policies. Uh, but that said, uh, the, the government and, uh, and we in the Department of Foreign Affairs are, are, are repositioning ourselves, our relationship with Africa, away from the old aid relationship and we are trying to work harder towards uh, developing economic partnerships, economic linkages, because it's fairly clear, and, and Asia is a, is a good example of this, that uh, it's economic growth, economic development, uh, and the private sector uh, that will generate the jobs and the growth for Africa in the future. And uh, although, of course, aid is good, uh, it, in terms of uh, alleviating poverty at a micro level, it's uh, the, the inflow of foreign investment to create jobs and to help develop the continent, that's where the, uh, the large gains will be really made in, in helping Africa to mm. grow mm. And, and manage its future. And, and the investment flows into Africa will and they, and they do at the moment, certainly dwarf uh, overseas development assistance flows into Africa. Yeah. I just want to stay on that trade and investment point that you make and, you know, the, the billions of dollars of Australian investment within Africa. And, Roger, you mentioned that you've got two startups in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, first of all, if you could just explain what those startups are. What we've done in Nigeria, because we understood the market and the need um, and the huge population within Lagos as an example, we understand that we understood that there's a lot of distressed stock in Australia, return goods, after, particularly after Christmas, and we negotiated with a number of uh, large uh, Australian retailers to buy those goods at, at very reduced prices and then set up a warehouse in Lagos, and that's gone well. Uh, I've also understood the shift, well I, I believe I understand the shift that's occurring in Africa and we've looked for technology opportunities to, to, to import and establish uh, those businesses in Africa. So those are the two startup opportunities. There's another opportunity as well, we've looked at our vocational education system and Daniel Andrews has talked about Victoria as being the education state. To me, when I went to Africa, the thing that is lacking most in, Tilla, in um, Africa is their vocational education system. They have a huge, uh, they have a very significant high ed system throughout Africa, and I'm talking about sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, but the thing that is lacking in um, Africa is the vocational education system, and we've started to work with governments in Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, and South Africa to help um, unemployed youth and provide them with skills using our local TAFE system. Mm. So why did you pick Nigeria? Nigeria, um, when it repositioned itself, uh, it rebased its economy back in, I think it was a, two years ago, it, it immediately got my attention. I thought, this economy is moving, there must be an opportunity. I happen to know a Nigerian person and I said to him, what about doing something in Nigeria? You know, I'm of an age now where I can take some risks. Um, I feel that Australia is very hard to, to establish a brand new business. Um, let's go to Africa. Mm. I've got the skills, I've got the appetite, I've got the desire. 
which is in the wrong place. So Let's go to Africa. So you weren't dismayed by all the narratives that we get about Nigeria, mainly to do with you know Boko Haram <laughs> and all those stories that you hear about. Okay. That didn't dissuade you from My going wife certainly was. <laughs> she was very scared. And this is the, at the height of the Ebola epidemic. I went into Nigeria, I took all the risks. I said, who cares? You know, if I'm going to go, I'm going to do this. But let me tell you something about uh, West Africa. It's probably the most exciting place. I arrive there and um, the first day, generally, I'm, I'm a little bit disoriented. But the second day, I love it so much. And the people are so wonderful and so caring. And the crime rate in southern Nigeria is so low. And I speak to all the taxi drivers, not just the ambassadors. I speak to all the taxi drivers and I say, Roger, no crime. Mm. No crime. And as a South African, that's, that's quite a significant thing. Yes. No crime. Ethiopia, I speak to the taxi drivers and I say, if I was to walk through this little village here, what would happen to me? Nothing, sir. You'd be most welcome, no matter. And um, off I go, you know. And um, Okay. Um, Andrew, um, how much work is being done to, you know, assist Australians that are seeking to invest in Africa? You know, what, what are some of the, you know, tools available that, you know, they can access? Um, Austrade is the... Uh the arm of the Australian government that works to help uh, Australian trade and investment in Africa. Uh, that's not really my field exactly. They're a separate uh, government organisation, but they do provide advice and uh, contacts uh, for Australian business. I think typically it's the small to medium sized businesses who do go to them. Uh, and. Austrade, I think, is specialising in, in a handful of countries where they see they can add the most value, um, where they see the, uh, the conditions are best for Australian investors, uh, and they also targeting a number of sectors, uh, the, the mining sector, obviously, education, uh, and uh, I think uh, the, technical, the mm. technical sector. But in terms of uh, support, consular mm -hmm. support, in, um, uh, uh, Roger talked about West Africa, um, largely Francophone. Um, Australia has no representation in Francophone Africa. Um, so, w you know, where do mm. Australians that are seeking to invest mm. in somewhere like Senegal, yep. um, who would they go to speak to, to you know, mm. try and create some, you know, yeah. ties in investing well, the, it? Uh, DFAT, uh, the Foreign Affairs and Trade Department, uh, we we do work with Austrade in providing uh, assistance to uh, Australian businesses looking to uh, to work and who are working in Africa. It's not just Austrade, I should say. Uh, our embassies and high commissions throughout Africa, and we have uh, seven in sub-Saharan Africa. They, uh, the the high commissioners and ambassadors, and the uh, the Australian-based staff, the, the Embassy High Commission staff, they are very attuned to the, uh, mm. the business environment in their countries. They, uh, they know the, uh, where the emphasis, where the, the governments need to uh, put their resources and, and make the changes. And uh, in our dealings with, or with, in their dealings with the, the African governments, that they're accredited to, they uh, they will be strong advocates for Australian business interests and and advise uh, or work with the the host governments to uh, create the better enabling environment for uh, Australian business. And although we have only seven uh, or eight, if you count Cairo, our embassy in Cairo, eight. Uh, missions across the 54 countries of Africa. Uh, we do have diplomatic relations now with every country, I think it is, or almost every country. So our embassy in uh, Accra in Ghana, for example, is accredited to, uh, I think, 13 countries in West Africa. Uh, our High Commission in Abuja is accredited to about another half a dozen countries. Mm -hmm. And the... Uh, High Commissioners in both Abuja and Accra, they do visit uh, their countries of accreditation regularly, have meetings with senior government ministers and officials, yep. and will prosecute the Australian business case uh, and advocate for Australian businesses yep. along the way. Okay. I, 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 
just going back to an earlier point that I'd, uh, I'd, I'd raised about, you know, Australia abandoning Africa, and if you thought that was mm -hmm. the case, and, and I understand that, you know, you're a diplomat and you're here and um, you're talking to us in, in, in the way that you are, but I guess, you know, one of the questions that we, we, we you know, that, that I'd like to know is, what is Australia's actual engagement with Africa? I mean, beyond the diplomatic, you know, consular mm -hmm. officials meeting yeah. and high commissioners and, you know, aside from the businesses themselves, mm -hmm. what is the Australian government doing in these countries um, in order to, you know, strengthen the relationships yeah. between the two continents? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and, and everyone knows that we did cut, Australia did cut its uh, bilateral aid program with Africa, but nevertheless, we've still got almost half a billion Australian dollars a year going into Africa in, in aid and assistance. Uh, we've got, uh, besides the bilateral aid programs, there's uh, th about $30 million going to uh, Australian NGOs working in 26 or 27 African countries on projects. Uh, we last year we gave about 80 million dollars in humanitarian assistance to Africa uh, I think it was 19.5 million to South Sudan 13 and a half million dollars to no sorry 19 and a half million dollars to Somalia 13 and a half million dollars to uh, South Sudan Sorry, Three, Andrew, I, yep, I might have sorry. to interject you there okay. because you are running through the statistics yep. again and um, we've got very limited time yep. and we've got a lot of ground to cover and a lot of these details um, are, you know, in the public yep, yep, domain yep. so people can access sure. this information. Yep. And what I really want to get to is the practicality, you know, what's really happening mm. on the ground um, yep. that well, the government's doing. But, yep. you know, I'll, I'll let you think about that for a while and I'll go to Roger um, and Roger, just, you know, you've, you've done some uh, investment and work in South Africa. Yes. Um, what can you tell us about, about, you know, what's going on there and the energy there and the level of uh, trade and investment that's happening? In South Africa in particular? Yeah. South Africa to me is at, at a crossroads right now. Um, I tend to focus more on Ethiopia right now and Why Nigeria. Ethiopia? I feel South Africa, the ANC has been uh, right, since 1994. When they came to power, there was two million people on benefits. Now there's 16 million people on benefits. They have, they haven't done enough to alleviate poverty in their country. They are not necessarily as open to business as, say, Ethiopia would be. Um, so South Africa, although it has all the infrastructure, it's workable. It's a great city. People are still open. Uh, one of the hotspots in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, is South Africa. To me, that is a dangerous place. And be, being South African. Uh, I understand that, and it, it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm cautious, I tread carefully. The rest of Africa, Nigeria, child's play compared to South Africa. Ethiopia, child's play. Ghana, as safe as it can be, except for the northern part where Boko Haram is. But Lagos, you're as safe as ours is. Okay. But yeah. we also don't want to fall into the trap of generalising a lot of these African countries, you know, because experiences vary depending on... Of course, on experiences vary. And I can talk anecdotally from my experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the reason why I brought up South Africa is because it is Australia's largest trading partner in Africa. Yes. Um, and I do know that, I mean, we're talking about one-way trade here, Australia to Africa, yes. but there's also a lot of trade coming from Africa into Australia. And Andrew, perhaps you might want to touch on that, you know, with, um, I know Woolworth South Africa has invested in, in David Jones. You know, they've, they're mm -hmm. now controlling that, they're majority shareholders in that. And there's Nando's, everyone loves Nando's, that's a, an African, you know, company. Um, what can you tell us about the, you know, the African trade that's coming into Australia and why don't we, you know, hear enough about it? It's a good question. I think in part the, or, or largely the, the Australian imports from Africa are crude oil from Nigeria. That, that does distort the trade figures a bit and give a bit of a, uh, uh, a strange picture to the, the figures. I think in actual terms of uh, merchandise trade, it's not great. Uh, and that's something that we would like to, uh, to mm. encourage and develop in the future. Mm. One of the, um, w every time I have conversations with people that are seeking to invest in Africa or are investing in Africa, is they talk about how Australian businesses are seen in Africa. You know, that is, Good you question. know, unlike, you know, the colonial countries and the imperialist nations, Australia's, you know, doesn't have that, tie mm. to many of the countries. So, 
why isn't Australia taking advantage of that? You know, you know, you're, we're hearing China and America expanding mm. their investment in Africa. Um, you know, where, where's Australia in all of that? Well, I think Australians do uh, have a, uh, a misperception of, of Africa and, and how difficult it is to do business in Africa. And I think Roger's a great example of someone who is... Uh, who, who sees the, the continent for, for what it is mm. and is, is working hard to, to, to educate the Australian people and, and break down that perception. And uh, Australia's largest footprint in terms of uh, uh, economic engagement is in our investments in the, the mining sector and there we do have a good reputation despite what a couple of uh, recent media articles might have said uh, about some issues that were about 10 years ago that uh, were largely uh, distorted in the media. I think the Australian mining companies uh, do have a very good reputation in Africa and uh, that's the feedback we get through our embassies and high commissions from the African governments. Mm. And we are working quite hard within our department to, to, to build on that, mm. to build on the comparative advantage we have in, in that field and uh, for the benefit both of Africa, its development and also the Australian uh, mm. business. Just, yeah. right. Just for that point. And the, the Australian Africa Chamber of Commerce, and we are doing a lot of work to to change that. You know, it, it's real meaningful work on the ground, particularly mm. for startup entrepreneurs who want to get into Africa. It's an ideal way to get in. But Africa, from Australia's point of view, suffers from a real brand, reputation type image. The Europeans haven't got that perception of Africa. Uh, a lot of uh, businessmen all over Europe and others, I sit at breakfast in the morning and I just listen to the accents and I pick where they're from. And the Brits are there, the Germans are there, and they're all investing, the Americans even so. But for me to engage with an Australian businessman, to talk to him about setting up a business in Africa, I'm hitting a brick wall often. And often even John Madieu, who's the trade commissioner, in Johannesburg for Austrade, so Roger, we just knock our heads up against a wall because people are just not getting Africa. People are, I, I think maybe it's a huge part to do with our location and, and uh, uh, our, our focus towards um, Southeast Asia and, <coughs> and China. It still captures so much of our attention, whereas Africa's coming online in a very serious way right now. But do you think that can continue to be an excuse. I mean, our geographical location mm. when Australia is seeking to, at an international level, play a big role in things like, you know, countering violent extremism and climate change and, you know, growing economies. <laughs> but, you know, surely the contributions that the African continent, you know, can make towards, you know, meeting that global challenge you can't be ignored. And why aren't we taking that up, you know? And can Question. geography continue to be an excuse, you know, the fact that we're isolated? Geography cannot continue to be an excuse, but I think the way we start here is we start small. We have some small wins. We start talking about it at, at our events, at the Australian Africa Chamber of Commerce events, and we, we share experiences. People get to meet um, African business people. And I think, you know, it, it starts to snowball from there. I think at a diplomatic and political level, uh, we do take Africa very seriously. I mean, 54 countries out of uh, just under 200 in the UN, Australia can't afford to ignore them. Uh, if we want to do anything in the UN, we've got to have uh, the Africans on side. And I think for our uh, recent term on the Security Council, we did very well both uh, engaging with the African countries to get their support to get on the council in the first place and then when we were on it for the two years we worked very hard as partners with Af with African countries advocating for them and about 60% or 70% of the UN Security Council work is on African crisis issues and Australia played a very uh, constructive and important role on the Security Council as one of the 10 non-permanent members to help resolve uh, and, and help progress peace and security in Africa. But with all due respect, Andrew, when Australia did lobby for these issues, these, you know, for mm -hmm. these African countries, it was because they were seeking a vote from these African countries to get mm -hmm. a place on the Security Council. Um, and once that tenure ended, that engagement effectively stopped. Um, so the question is, you know, what is Australia doing going forward? Because, I mean, 
we, we, we're coming around back in circles. You know, we, we go to aid, yeah. we go to investment, but when we go to investment, it's about Australian companies in African countries. Mm -hmm. We talk about aid, that's already been mm. cut. So, you know, that's... Well, I think it's a misperception and a mis, uh, misinterpretation of the situation to say that we, turn, we have turned our back on Africa because we have, in fact, increased the size of our embassies in Africa. Uh, we haven't opened a post in Africa since, uh, or Addis Ababa we opened in 2011. But uh, sorry to interject again, yeah. Andrew, those, you know, all well and good. Um, examples that come to mind was recently, you know, the United States talked about its investment in technologies and how it's helping young Africans, you know, mm. get started up. So instead of just that, you know, aid and giving mm. the money, yep. they're actually f helping them find practical solutions in which they can grow their local economies, mm. in effect also helping American economies. So what is Australia doing in terms of helping a lot of these countries progress Mm. and move forward well, by investing in some of these technologies. Well, the focus of our engagement now in Africa uh, at a bilateral and regional level is through education. It's, as Roger said before, uh, it's education and training and vocational skills training that Africa is going to need. And we have had a very vigorous uh, scholarship program with Africa, three and a half thousand students in Australia since 2011 uh, doing masters and, uh, and other courses that's significant and uh, the despite the cut in the bilateral aid program the uh, Australia awards program is continuing okay we'll move away from that issue for a second and I'll come back to you Roger um, sure. because we might have people in the audience that are from the African diaspora and I want to know from you um, you know as an African in the diaspora what role you know can Africans in diaspora play in the investment in Africa and is there an advantage to being you know as someone from the diaspora going back and investing in Africa okay so what role could a, a African person in Australia play in assisting very, very, a, a great deal. Usually they've got family back in, in, in Africa and a connection could be made for a business looking for someone. And you need someone on the ground in Africa you can trust and you need an introduction. So in all business cases, in all four countries that we've gone into, we've used somebody from Australia who I've met through our meetings to be able to introduce me to somebody local in Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, and even in South Africa. And from that, we've been able to develop a trusted relationship and allowed me, it allows me to sleep well at night with our investments in Africa. And I, and I wake up in the morning and I get an update, okay, sales have been so much, so much Naira for today. And you know, that allows me, so having somebody local to introduce you to somebody over there, a family member, I think it, it, it goes a long, long way in helping you to set up your business. Do you think there's, there's lessons that you know the Australian government can learn from the diaspora here, um, as it you know works to strengthen its ties with the continent. That's a good question. What lessons can the government? I think uh, diaspora have got a passion for Africa. They've got a um, they've got a um, an understanding, a deeper understanding than than the Australian government would have, for example, even the high high commissioners. So I think there needs to be some sort of dialogue occurring between the government and the diaspora about how to actually move forward in Africa. The amount of people that I meet that have brothers in senior ministerial positions or cousins in, in Africa, it's quite astonishing. Like mm. I, somebody was visiting my dad in a nursing home and um, his brother happened to be the employment minister in Ghana. So one thing led to another and, and I could take advantage of that relationship. Mm. Andrew, you're the only representative of the Australian government here with us, um, and I'm going to throw this question to you. Um, what's the Australian government doing? And, you know, are, are you working with the diaspora? Are you trying to strengthen those ties? And if so, what sort of work are you doing in that space? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. The, uh, I'd start by saying that uh, as an immigrant country, uh, as was America, the, uh, you know, we've got huge advantages and huge opportunities uh, in our position in the world because of our uh, immigrant uh, communities. Uh, and this certainly does play out in all sorts of ways. And as Roger said, there are uh, 
the, the family connections going back to Africa with senior people in government there is huge. Our department doesn't work particularly in this area. It's more the Department of Immigration and, and Ethnic Affairs that, that does uh, work through the diasporas. Mm -hmm. But surely there would be a role. I mean, whether it's through the community organisations, <coughs> I mean, there's, um, I think, majority of um, the English-speaking African countries are represented with the community group in Australia. Um, surely there'd be some kind of space at a you know government level where, where you know conversations can be held um, to hear from these communities and what they have to say and perhaps um, learn some things from them. Well, I mean, we do obviously interact with with community groups when they come to us or uh, we seek them out for uh, advice on occasions but uh, probably it's more through our posts in Africa th getting uh, information on the ground there that that we use uh, not to say that we don't uh, as I say interact with community groups here but just on that point with Andrew whenever there's a high commission that returns to Australia with a um, the Nigerian high commissioner the Australian high commissioner in Nigeria comes mm -hmm. back there's a, there's a re, there's a real integration where they, the diaspora meets with him they host him there's a lot of interaction that goes on mm -hmm. between the high commissions uh, the Australian high commissions in country and the Australian diaspora mm -hmm. um, and Ethiopia is the same case as well as well as South Africa as well mm -hmm. I mean, the reasons why I raised that was, you know, I was trying to look at the benefits. You mentioned that, um, you know, one of the great things about having connections within diaspora was it's helped you with your investments in Nigeria. Absolutely. And I'd like to think that at a government level, you know, some of those connections would be rather helpful, especially because Australia is relatively new in terms of investing in Africa mm -hmm. and, and many mm -hmm. of the people in the diaspora know their countries well. They know how things work and they know how these institutions uh, govern and are governed um, and perhaps there are, there are things that we could learn from that, you know? Well, it's Australian investment overseas and in Africa in this case is not led by government. It's led by the private sector. It's led by private individuals. And so it's not really appropriate for us to... Uh, to get involved. They come to us if there's an issue or they will talk to our missions in Africa mm -hmm. if there are issues but uh, when there are we act on them and we follow them up and we explore the issues using them, we're discussing with them but generally it's it's not for us as the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to uh, to try and tell Australians or Australian diaspora what they need to do or should be doing to invest or improve trade links between the two countries it just doesn't really work like that mm. i'm not just talking about you know trade and investment i'm talking about um some of the country knowledge that these mm -hmm. uh people have that mm. many of us wouldn't i mean you know we we sit in offices air conditioning and we read reports we're not really practically on the ground and a lot of these people have those l links and ties which could be of benefit you know for australians that are mm. seeking to invest in these places and learn about them and I'd, I'd just like to, you know, find out if, if there's any work being done and, and why it isn't. Well, well uh, I suppose where I see it as well, in relation to the, um, the WABC, um, the, the uh, African Australian, that's where we fill a role yep. for investors to come in and, and talk to diaspora and talk and, and see what connections can be made. Okay. So staying with the Australia-Africa Chamber of Commerce, for those that haven't been mm. along to one of your events, uh, talk us through how you try and engage the diaspora with um, you know, some of the things that go on on the continent. Well, there's various ways we engage the diaspora. It's, it's open, there's invitations, we build our database incrementally, we continue to invite people and we have regular events at Chamber House on Exhibition Street, I think it's the fifth floor, and, and that occurs on a, on a bi-monthly basis. We have more a, a big event, we'd get an approach from from the Rwandan um, High Commission, and that's that's occurring, I think, very soon, and we'll send an invitation out. So, what, what happens at these events when someone shows up? You know, what what, so, what do they expect to get out of it? Well, it, it depends what they what they're looking for. Particularly, it, it's really around investment, around how you could do business um, in country in Africa, whether it be Ethiopia, Rwanda, or, or any other country, and you'll get to meet existing businesses and they'll talk from their experience of, of what's actually going on on the ground there. Then there'll be an opportunity for a full briefing 
from the ambassador or a representative from the High Commission to talk about what's actually occurring in the ground, on the ground, how you'd invest, how you'd set up a bank out, how you'd repatriate funds back to Australia, what the difficulties would be around that, what opportunities, what they are actually specifically looking for. And we'd target um, organisations that fr within Victoria that, and, and Australia that are providing those services and see what we can do about matching those um, opportunities to the suppliers in Australia. Mm. Can I just briefly add, yeah. uh, getting back to what DFAT does about engaging with uh, the diaspora in Australia, I mean, what, we're based in Canberra, DFAT, and in Canberra we do go along and we do meet with uh, the diaspora organisations when you know they're holding a, uh, a national day function, for example, or a celebration, but equally our state offices, we have a, DFAT has an office in each of the states, and that's where I guess the larger diaspora communities are and the state offices of Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade do get out and meet with uh, community groups there. They're invited to various functions and meetings and then they do pass back to us in Canberra mm -hmm. the key messages mm -hmm. from the diaspora groups. Yep. Um, one of the points that you raised, Roger, was about um, one of the challenges of you know, speaking to Australians and trying to get them to invest in Africa and you talked about that brick wall that you're usually met with. Um, why, why, why are Australians reluctant to invest in Africa? I think it's, I really do think it's distance. I think it's the understanding of how far it is to get there and to get over to West Africa, it's, it's what, three, four flights to get there. And I think it's just not on the, the radar of Australian businesses. However, Sintel, I want to make this point, I want to make this point emphatically. What I'm seeing in Africa, the openness to deal with Australians and Australian businesses, there's the, uh, it's great to be Australian in Africa. And Joanna Adamson, the High Commissioner in Accra, said to me, Roger, the brand Australia carries a lot of weight and the doors are open and, and there's a lot of trust towards Australia. They haven't got that baggage that the South Africans have got. Um, there's a little bit of animosity, South Africa and, and the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa for the, for the reasons of what's occurred recently with, with, with the um, Zimbabweans and the Malawians. Um, and the Europeans, they've also treated Europeans with, a, with, with caution. They, they're afraid to deploy the, or to send their, their, their children to study in America for all the gun issues. Now, Australia is seen as a clean, functional, safe and open place. Are we and capitalising on that though? No, we're not capitalising on that. I have a huge difficulty selling to organisations saying, let's go and take this over. I've really got to put my, my body on the line, my heart on the line to say to them, okay, we need to go and invest and, and do things there. And even with the TAFE sector, the, the opportunity is so massive to to build skills in Africa and have governments pay for the services that our uh, TAFEs render in country. Uh, I, I'm just not getting across the line there. And I consider myself a good salesperson, but I tell you, it's um, it's interesting. Well, I, I think things are changing, though. And one example I can give is uh, Austrade is uh, one of its key sectors it's promoting is the education sector. Mm -hmm. They are uh, organising a trade, mission. trade fair in mm -hmm. uh, Abuja and yeah. Accra. Yeah. And they were hoping to get about 10 Australian uh, universities to, to join them in West Africa and they got about 20. So uh, there is a, a, a growing awareness in Australia of the uh, the new dynamic in Africa and the, the new opportunities that, uh, that are there. It, it's partly a function I think of the, uh, the, the historical past with Africa that there were uh, until not so long ago, just a handful of countries where there was democracy, uh, where there was a uh, good uh, <laughs> enabling environment for business. Uh, the number of countries now that are uh, democracies and, and the most startling example of that is the Nigerian election, where for the first time in Nigeria's history, the biggest country in Africa, the biggest economy, had a peaceful transition to a new uh, president. If I may as well, I don't think Smart Traveller helps a lot as well because you reconsider your need to travel to Nigeria and my wife's freaking out and she's in her own travel business. She says, you go and book it somewhere else, go to Flight Centre. And, you know, the, you, Nigeria is safe. 
South, southern Nigeria is safe, no problems. Mm. So we, you know, talking about these cities, and one of the things we try to do here at Africa Talks is to really start shifting the narratives mm. around Africa and some of um, the misconceptions about it. And I'd like you know, to, you particularly, Roger, to give us a flavour of what it's actually like in these cities for those that haven't been. I mean, um, I was reading something about how some African countries have leapfrogged certain technologies. You know where. You know, before some communities couldn't afford having landlines because they didn't have, um, you know, the infrastructure in place. But that technology has been leaf leapfrogged now by mobile phones. Everyone's got a mobile phone. And so how is that working towards Africa's advantage and, 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 and what's it all like? You know, what's the energy like and, you know, are people hungry for investment and how are they doing it? Okay. There's a lot of questions in there. Uh, certainly, Africa is made up of multiple countries. Um, some countries are lagging behind, certainly, and, and, and I feel Nigeria and Ghana are lagging behind. But you take, for example, Ethiopia. The country is hungry for investment. I look around and I observe our people dress. Everybody's well-dressed. No matter how poor they are, they're well-dressed. And I, and I pay particular attention to that in every country that I go to. Governments and the ability for Australian businesses to meet with ministers and, and key decision makers is relatively easy. The desire for us to invest is high. And they will boast about the fact that they are building rail infrastructure, the safety of their countries, the technology. Everybody's got three or four mobile, well, uh, two or three mobile phones easily. And, um, but that's mainly due to the fact that the networks go down, so they've got to be able to replace it with another network. So you have, you have MTN and you have, uh, which is the other one in, um, in Nigeria, I forget, but anyway. And um, so they go down. But having said that, um, there's a hunger, there's a desire, and the intensity to do business. If you're going to meet somebody on a plane and you're going to exchange business cards, be careful because it's not going to stop. This guy's going to pursue you and, and, and have opportunities for you. And, and some of them are very legitimate in terms of their, their desire mm. and, and the opportunities that they present to you. But what about some of the innovations? You know, we read about how in Kenya there's the M-Pesa system in which people are using mobile phones to pay for things. I mean, technologies that we don't even have here in Australia. Mm. Um, and how is that working to these economies' benefit? You know, you talked about a growing middle class before. How, how is all that? How is all of that playing playing up? I sort of don't know much about Kenya. I, I don't really know about that technology. I haven't seen it, and um, so I can't really. But in terms of innovation, with what you've seen in Nigeria, for example, or in Ethiopia, the smartly dressed people aside, but you know, what are some of the uh, you know things that you've seen that you've kind of gone, wow, this is being done differently, and perhaps you know we could learn something from this. Yeah, what's been done differently, I suppose, is. <sighs> It's, uh, there's infrastructure being built rapidly now and uh, the desire to, to position themselves. For example, Ethiopia's taken a position that it's, di it, it's, not it, it's really tried to balance its economy and, and to diversify it in a way that it's sustainable. That's what I'm observing. But on, in terms of small innovations, I haven't really seen a lot in Africa that I can actually draw on it and say that's a specific innovation. I, th I think in the mining sector, uh Australia is capitalising on the uh, the interest in African countries to uh, modernise there and attract investment so that they can take advantage of the natural resources. And uh, for example, we have a project in uh, Ghana where uh, we're helping, working with the government there on a cadastra project to help map uh, the natural resources of the country so that the government and the people actually know what resources they have uh, so that they can better plan to, uh, to develop them. So you know, that's an example of where uh, modern uh, the technology is, is helping. And for the, for the METS sector, the, the, the mining equipment and technology services sector of Australia, uh, Africa is the biggest market outside of Australia for Australian METS companies. And these are all companies working with Africa in the, uh, the leading edge of technology. Thank you. Um, you're wondering why Australians are nervous about going into Africa. And I'm just surprised that you haven't touched on corruption and the perception, even if it's only a perception, 
but places like Kenya that are uh, English speaking, that should be open to all sorts of trade with Australia, mm -hmm. uh, corruption is rife. So why, why are you not mentioning this? Um, the, the question to me? I mean, one of the reasons why we steered clear of that, it's, it's with the aid narrative as well as with the corruption narrative and with the disease and poverty narrative, they all warrant some time spent on them. But one of the focuses of this is really trying to look at where Australia's relationship is. And as you point out, corruption is it. But you know, I could also point out that corruption also is here in Australia. So it depends on how you're looking at it. Um, but I'll also let you know, Andrew and Roger take that up as well. My experience in Nigeria, for example, uh, we deal at a retail level. We've not witnessed corruption at all in, in terms of who we've dealt with. We've had no approaches by government or any officials to do this. I do get stopped at airports and people will try and ask me for money. I, I, I tend to walk straight through. I'm familiar. I know it. And I just ignore them. And I smile at them. I say, well, like, why don't you give me some money is my usual response. <laughs> and, and that's the response I use. The first time I was intimidated when I went there. But after that, it was straightforward. You know, and I haven't encountered a lot of corruption in those countries, honestly. And we also don't want to fall under the trap of generalizing. Because you know, yeah. a situation in one country might be different somewhere else. Another question. Thanks. Um, I want to... What am I doing? Oh, okay. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to and be equally excited about how wonderful and friendly and non-problematic Tanzania is. Welcome to Tanzania. I will. Travel. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. And uh, we're very keen to invest. Um, part of my uh, conundrum is I missed one in two, so I don't know if you've done one in... What happened in... Sessions one and two. Um, as somebody who is of Tanzanian origin and is returning back all the time, yes. as I realize that we need, I don't know if I'm, I'm part of a diaspora. I never left my country of origin. I just came and lived here for a little bit. So I don't necessarily assume a di I'm, a, I'm a diasporic population that will look upon the homeland as somewhere I loved very much. Yes. <laughs> I continue to go back and engage. Um, and as part of going back and engaging all the time, and it was recently of two months ago, I noticed um, for both of you, as I flew over northern Tanzania, endless mining, just endless mining, of which some of the mining is Australian. Um, as somebody who has an environmental global yeah. issue in my head, as a Tanzanian <laughs> and an Australian, um, I'm anxious about mining because I can see people being moved out of country, not having access to the land that they could have shambas on, for those of you who know what a shamba is, small plots of land. Uh, so mining is a problem. What I notice, and I'm noticing massively in Tanzania, particularly, I can't speak about anywhere else, is that there is an industry for Australians to come and invest in healthcare, pharmaceuticals and treatment. Because basically, what's happening is the middle class is growing, they're getting extremely unwell, and there is no treatment. No treatment. Yeah. So I'd like you to talk about that. Certainly. Um, would you care to go? Uh, what we're trying to do with the TAFE sector is, is uh, taking training, health and you know, child care training, uh, age care training, uh, training for nurses, even training for, for road trauma accidents, how to treat those things on. So we, we're looking at a whole lot of opportunities on the continent all the way, and certainly governments are open to that. That is a priority area. Building construction, IT, uh, healthcare, um, teacher training, and there's one more, agribusiness. So we're looking at those five key sectors. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't have malaria and you don't have diarrhea, but you're dying of kidney failure. I understand. You are dying. Yeah. And the governments, we're talking to them along those lines. Oh, they were here getting uh, awards. She got an yeah. award last night yeah. from the University of New South Wales. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll take another question. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kelly Horton. I'm the treasurer of the Australia Africa Chamber of Commerce. So I have a question for you, Andrew, because I talk to Roger all the time. <laughs> so just as someone who lived in West Africa, in Senegal, a few years ago, 
I was running my former company's West African operations as an environmental and social consultancy. We had a lot of work with mining companies over there because there was a real demand for international experience. So we started a company over there where we employed a number of um, Senegalese uh, environmental and social engineers. And um, one of the things that was a big problem for me personally when I was working over there was that I was quite unable to travel to other countries in the region because my visa in Senegal was very difficult to get. And at the time, there'd been discussion of an Australian embassy in Dakar, um, which is now, as far as I understand, off the table. But, you know, what in terms of um, you were mentioning helping businesses, it wasn't really a role, but certainly in respect to diplomatic relationships to help people move around Africa. You know, I just wanted to see if you had any comments on that because there would have been a lot more opportunity for work and investment and relationship building, but I couldn't get back into Senegal because I got detained. So, <laughs> twice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a very uh, good question. Uh, we're very aware that our footprint in Africa isn't large. Uh, our department and also our minister is very keen to uh, to grow it uh, as soon as possible. We have got honorary consuls in uh, quite a number of African countries in addition to the seven um, embassies and high commissions. Senegal is a, is a key country, as you say, um, in, a, in uh, Francophone Africa and West Africa. And uh, you know, this is a decision for the Australian government, not for the bureaucrats like myself. But I do know that it's it's being looked at again, and you know, we we hope that in the future uh, we might expand our footprint. And Senegal would probably be one of the next cabs off the rank, I think, for a new post in Africa. Any other questions? Uh, hi, thanks Andrew for coming along today and facing the crowd. It must have been a tough one to do. Um, <laughs> I do know that sort of one way to break down those preconceived ideas and things is for people to have an opportunity to travel to Africa. Mm. Um, and the volunteer program that the Australian government ran was one way to do that, but I know that's suffered some hits. Is there other things you can see in, in terms of whether it's education opportunities or the Colombo plan or things like that for Australians to get over um, and have an experience of their own? Yes, certainly. Uh, yeah, very good question. Uh, it, it it was a pity that the the volunteers program has been cut. It's still remaining in Africa. We haven't cut it completely in Africa. It's uh, staying in a couple of countries, but it it is smaller than it used to be. Uh, the new Colombo plan, we uh, it it doesn't include Africa at the moment, but uh, the government is consolidating it into the the first tranche of countries. Uh, in uh, in the, the more uh, the, the closer region to Australia, we hope that when uh, after the first phase it will expand into Africa. But uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, backstage, the, the the government's recently announced the establishment of the the AGAR, the Advisory Group on Australia Africa Relations, and uh, that will I expect look at ways to. Uh, increase people-to-people -people links uh, between the continents. Mm. Any other questions? No other questions. Um, going back to that, the, the, the advisory uh, group, yes. um, I, I have noticed that there, there are more and more conferences and summits taking place, not just mm -hmm. in Australia but in Africa, where you're trying to get that engagement with, um, with communities and with uh, groups. And how's that going? And uh, well, last week we had the uh, Africa Down Under conference, which is a three-day mining conference in Perth. It was preceded by the uh, East African Oil and Gas Conference and also a uh, Australia Africa Research Forum sponsored by some of the universities in Western Australia, including Murdoch University. And uh, it was five days of, of meetings and discussions about Africa and about the interaction between Australia and Africa. Uh, and the AGAR, the uh, advisory group on Australia-Africa relations, uh, has it in mind now to uh, work towards making uh, the first week in September when Africa Down Under, which is uh, a very large gathering of, of Australian Africans, 
to make that a, an Africa week in Perth. And so they'll, they'll be exploring that further uh, in the coming months to try and get that up and running. And that will include uh, links in the sporting area, uh, trade, people to people, arts, fashion. And that could be a really great opportunity to promote a positive image of Africa and a... Uh, Here in Australia or in, or in Africa? It will be in Perth. Yeah, yeah, so amongst oh, the Australian audience or with, with an African Well, both audience? really. I mean, there will be no doubt uh, efforts to bring African groups, sporting groups, uh, cultural groups out to Australia and, uh, and the, 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 they will take back to them, uh, take back with them to Africa uh, more knowledge and hopefully positive impressions of, of Australia. So I guess before we leave tonight, and this is directed to both of you, um, you know, a lot of the language that we're hearing from the government is is that Australia is currently focused with its nearest neighbours, Asia, and um, that's where the priorities are. But going forward, what place does Africa have in 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 Australia's engagement and in foreign policy? In foreign policy, I don't know, but in the business, in the business community, I think it, it represents a huge opportunity for young entrepreneurs, small businesses, to set up in a very serious way and take advantage of not only the African market, low um, low wages, a really low cost center to produce, and manufacture, as well as to export to 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 Europe, to to Asia, and to America. The market's right there. You know, particularly for West and East Africa, great place to be. I think Africa is certainly uh, well on the mind of the Australian government and, and governments and bureaucracies can chew gum and walk at the same time. We can focus on our immediate uh, region of the Pacific and, and uh, Southeast Asia, but at the same time also work with uh, Africa. Uh, we're very aware that, as I said at the beginning, that it's such a growing continent with uh, huge potential. It's in Australia's uh, strategic interest that Africa does grow and, and continues on a trajectory of uh, stability and uh, economic prosperity, and we've got to work with Africa to help them on mm -hmm. that. And we certainly don't want to get left behind if the Chinese are exploiting Africa or uh, the Europeans. We certainly want to be in there working with Africa to uh, help them develop and, and uh, improve and increase the linkages. Fantastic. Well, on that note, that brings to an end tonight's Africa Talks on Australia's relationship with Africa. I hope that um, you were able to leave with something and get a better understanding of where we stand and hopefully um, there's room to move forward. Um, and a big thank you to our guests tonight, Andrew Barnes from DFAT and Roger thank Phillips. Thank you very much.